All right, welcome to week two of Crown. How many of you are glad to be in church? Come on, man. God doing something great in your life. Uh, it's a life message. It took me from a pathway of addiction to a life of purpose. And, but before we do, I just want to take a minute and look in that camera. Newcastle, we love you. Come on, man. Welcome, Newcastle. Come on. Second week of our, of course, our launch at the Newcastle campus. We believe God has great things for the city of Newcastle. His victory is now one church in two locations. Come on, man. Yeah, tell, tell Newcastle how much you're grateful they're here with us today. Come on. We love you all. We're, this is a four-week series, something we're, we're calling Crowned. It's, it's actually the message that, from God's Word that changed my life. And my hope as you go through this message over these four weeks is that you actually begin to understand that God wants to deal with you individually. He wants to grow you like he grew me. God didn't grow me because I'm a pastor. I didn't grow spiritually because I'm a pastor. I grew spiritually because I'm a Christian. And I want you to see that there's a divine and distinct purpose for your life. It's so critically important. And the first week we talked about being crowned with the Father's love. If you weren't here last week, I sure hope you go back. Don't listen to this one. You want to watch it. How many of you remember the video at the end? Was that, you got to watch that last week. It was incredible being crowned with the Father's love. This week we'll talk about being crowned with dignity and worth from God. Then next week we'll talk about being crowned with a divine inheritance. Do you know that Jesus himself left you a divine inheritance and there is a way by which you can appropriate that inheritance? How many of you think you'd like to get the inheritance left to you? Come on, man. How many of you think Jesus left you a decent inheritance? Come on, man. Well, you want to know how to receive it. Then the last week is crowned with peace. Peace with God and peace from God. So this week, let's jump right in to crown with dignity and worth. I want to answer three questions about how you discover God's values and worth, how you get your dignity and worth from God. I want to answer three questions. Here's the first one. How do I determine my worth? What am I worth? What am I worth? Is worth determined in this life by how much money you make? The success of your life. Achievement of goals. Is, is worth diminished if you, if, if you don't do well? Is, is your worth diminished if you've been traumatized? Maybe abandoned or hurt? Maybe you're going to go home today to a fractured marriage or a broken home. Maybe, I don't know all the different circumstances. Perhaps you're going to go leave this place and maybe poverty has gripped you. And there'll be people that will actually be going and, and living in, in government housing in less than ideal conditions. Is that how you determine your worth? If you don't know how to determine your worth from God's heart, you will be driven to externals for your whole life. And there's some of the wealthiest people on the earth are trying to find their value and worth through achievement. And you please remember this. Anything you gain at the expense of God's plan, you will forfeit something much greater much sweeter and much more precious to you than what you gain. God has crowned you with glory and honor and dignity and worth. Let me tell you where this began for me. And this is the path that I know God wants to take you on. Is over your life, God will speak into your heart through his word and through his people. And as you pray, he'll speak things into your heart. And, and I had one of those events when I was a young man. In fact, I was just left Bible school when I was on staff at my home church. And the pastor had invited a bunch of people to his house and he was selling his home and it was like, it was like a small little party and there were probably 30 people there. But the downstairs was not set for 30 people. Have you ever been to the place where it's just kind of your, it's not wall to wall, but you, anywhere you move, you're kind of doing this. And, and when everybody's talking, it seems like there's like a low roar in the room just because everyone's talking, right? So it's kind of loud. Something happened in that room, but before I get you there, I want to talk to you about the guy who did it. There was a guy that was about to change the atmosphere in the room. His name's Angelo. Let me tell you a little bit about Angelo. He's an Italian guy, an old guy that I grew up knowing, and he was rough around the edges. No, nope. Angelo didn't even have edges. He was just rough. <laughs> On the 50th wedding anniversary, my pastor invites he and his wife up to the platform, and, and they're going to pray over them, and he hands the microphone to Angelo's wife. And she's, you know, thank you, Jesus, for our many years to get real sweet. Handed it to Angelo. I'm not exaggerating. Here's what he said. I wanted to kill her once for every year we've been married. <laughs> Handed the mic back. 
Now, he didn't go to the XO conference, okay, so uh, with Jimmy <laughs> Evans. So, now, if you knew Angelo, he was just, he was really a marshmallow with his wife, but he just was, man, he was rough. I met him when I was 14. My dad owned a building in this steel mill town, and, and he was renovating it, and I'd go, and I was there helping him. And Angelo came by, and my dad introduced me to him. Angelo, this is my son, John, this is Angelo. He never even looked at me. He said, looked at my dad, he said, that boy worth anything? I don't think my dad answered him, and they ignored me. <laughs> he never said a word to me. So Angelo, let's just say, was a direct fellow. So we're at this party, room full of people. Angelo is not happy because there had been an appraisal done on this home because they were going to sell it, and the appraisal came in very favorably. Angelo owned like four or five homes in this little town, and he felt like he knew the cost of, of every home in that town. And it, for whatever reason, and Angelo didn't need one, it infuriated him. And so he told everybody he could in the party, I found out later, one after one, this house isn't worth what this, and he'd just go off. Finally, I guess he figured he couldn't get the 30 people, and he used me. I was across the room, and I hadn't seen him yet, and I made eye contact. You ever make eye contact across the room? You go, hey, and just, you, you don't say it out loud, but and, uh, you know, good. Well, the minute I did that, he, his eyes hit me. And then he yelled, and the, and, and, and the, and the room went, went silent. He went, hey, boy! And everybody's like, you're startled, what? And he's looking at me. Now I feel like an idiot. They're like, oh, what, what did I do? And he's like, he yells, you want to know what this house is worth? And I'm like, no, <laughs> I don't care. I'm 20-something, 20 22 or 3, what do I care? He wasn't talking to me, he was using me. Now, you know, you're in that environment, you think, oh, everyone's, I don't care. I'm like, because I know he's going to say something. Angelo's, and he yells, I'll tell you what it's worth, son. It's worth what someone's willing to pay for it. I don't care what the appraiser said. It ain't worth a plug nickel, that appraisal, unless he cashes the check. This house ain't worth nothing until you get the check and what's worth what someone pays for it. And, and he was done with me. And, you know, I'm kind of embarrassed, like, oh, my gosh, I didn't want Angelo. And he just went back to talking to people. He didn't care. Now, something happened to me I never would have expected at that moment. The Holy Spirit took the words of me. I don't know if God ever used Angelo in his life, but this time he did. <laughs> no, he, was a, he really was a precious guy. If, you had to get down deep, real deep, but he was precious. And, no, he, he really was. He, he, no, honestly, if you knew him, anyway, we'll move on. And he... Uh, Man, Angelo's just, you know, he's, he, I'm standing there and the Holy Spirit just inside my heart speaks to me. Now you may ask, how, what does that even mean? It, it's, it, and God wants to do this for you, by the way. That's why you should read the Bible and have a, a, a devotional life. God will tell and he'll speak to your heart. Here's what, it, let me explain it like this. It's like someone drops five, six sentences or a paragraph in your heart like that. And it's there and you know it. That's how he actually speaks inside you. Sometimes it's just a knowing, it's just a, an awareness. Sometimes it's like, it's as real as if someone talked to you. And that, that was one of those moments. And I can tell you why, because I never would have expected that. I was feeling embarrassment at the time. So the last thing I'm thinking of is that God's going to speak to my heart. And listen to what the Holy Spirit spoke to me. After Angelo said, this house is only worth what someone's willing to pay for it, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. He said, that's your appraised value to me. What I was willing to purchase you with, that's your value. And it cha listen, when, when, you, um, when you get that understanding that your appraised value to God is not based on what you've done for or against him, where you've succeeded or where you failed, where your life is good or where it's bad, your value is determined by the one who purchased you. You know what the worth of something is by what someone's willing to pay for it. And Jesus purchased us with his very own blood. He purchased us with his very own blood. You're... Your appraised value to God is the blood of God. That's your value. And when that begins to sink into how you think about yourself, it's a game changer. You know, the Bible actually tells you, tells me we're a chip off the old block. You ever hear that, that statement? That kid's a chip off the old block. He's like his father. She's like her mom. Listen to in Genesis chapter 1. You really are. We really are a chip off the old block of God. Genesis 127. So God created man... In his own image and likeness. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. 
When you put man and woman together, you have the full image of God in the earth. God said, I created you in my image. Every human being on planet earth has ultimately been created by God. And they have intrinsic value because they are made in the likeness and image of God. You'll hear people say this. We're all God's children. We aren't. We are all God's creation. We are not all God's children. Well, how do we become God's children? Jesus said it this way. To, to any, it's as many as believed on Jesus, to him, to them, they, he gave the power to become the children of God. To become a child of God, you've got to receive a savior. And, but all of us are the creation of God. So there's intrinsic value in every human being. And until you know what something's worth, you don't know how to treat it. That's why you don't give expensive crystal to a, a three-year-old to play with. They don't know the value of it. All of us, most of us in this room will have an iPhone or uh, 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 an Android. And if you are still stuck with your Blackberry, you know, Jesus loves you. And, uh, but, you know, the iPhones are very, very expensive. And so can, can, I, can I borrow your, your phone? Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so thank you. Um, iPhones are expensive. They cost a lot of money. Five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars, thousand dollars. And so we, we track them. We put them in cases. We, we cover the glass. We do all the, because it's valuable. You treat it very, very, very kindly. So if I'm going to take this iPhone with a hammer, you cringe, right? You're like, no, you really cringe. It's okay. But, and so, you know, if, if I'm about to hit the, you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Why would it bother you if I were to abuse this iPhone? Well, because you know, it has value. You know, it has worth. So if I were to lay it down, it's hard to keep calm down. And, and I do this to his iPhone. Now, before you hate me, this was a setup, okay? He's, it's an old dead phone, okay? Because folks are like, I'm out of here. That guy's an idiot, man. Question, why did it bother you? Because you know it's value. The same person who would never let somebody do this to their iPhone because they don't know their value and worth, will take abuse their whole life. I can't tell you how many times as a pastor I've watched, particularly young women, fall in love with a guy who treats her like garbage, butt of the jokes, physically abuse her, go to the hospital, she's been beaten, police trying to get her to press charges. You really, you, you've got to get out of there. You've got, he loves me. It's my fault. She doesn't know what she's worth. That same young lady would never let someone do that to her iPhone because it's valuable. Remember this, when your value and your worth is, is established externally and not from God, it affects the foundation from which you make every decision in your life. And a good life is simply a compilation of decisions. Some of the wealthiest people on earth are wealthy because they're trying to bring value that you can't get from man, you can't get from achievement. And yet you watch people over and over again, that young lady hypothetically, and it's not hypothetical, sadly I've seen it over and over again. The man, she's married to him, he abuses her, he cheats on her, eventually he just discards her. And then she goes and finds a guy just like him. Why? Is it just bad luck? No, she doesn't know what she's worth, so she doesn't know how to treat herself. If you understand that you have intrinsic worth to God, the God of the universe, it changes the way you see yourself. It took me from a path of addiction to a life of purpose. And it will do, this, it will do the exact same thing for every person. So what is man to God? Why are we so, why? Well, God, why man? The psalmist David had the very same question in the book of Psalms. He was looking into the night sky and the vastness of creation. Listen to what he said in Psalms 8, verse 3. He said, when I look into the night skies and I see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you've made, what is man that you're mindful of him? What's the son of man that you would care for him and visit him? For you've made man a little lower than the heavenly beings. It's the Hebrew word Elohim, which is meaning the supreme God. He said, you made man just a little lower than yourself. Now listen, and you've crowned, you've crowned him with glory and with honor and with dignity and with worth. 
David's saying, why man? He's looking at creation. He's like, we're this thing, this little dot. Why are you consumed with us? Why did you create us and crown us with glory and honor and dignity and worth? See, most people think of Adam and Eve as like the original nudist. You know, or they just ran around butt naked and they didn't, they didn't mind because they were free. Woohoo, free, you know, love Jesus, be naked. And uh, they were not naked. They just did not have a human covering. They did not know they were naked because they were not naked. They just were not clothed with any external human type of covering. They were clothed upon of God himself. They were covered and crowned with glory and honor and dignity and worth. And it was so significant and real is that it covered their human nakedness. That's the power of discovering your worth in God. Remember, your appraised value is not any other thing but the fact that Jesus died for you and God paid for you with his very own blood. Second question we want to answer is this then how did we lose this glory, this honor, and this dignity and worth? It's when the original couple, Adam and Eve, rejected God's loving plan. It's when they received the deception that would cause them to see God differently and reject the plan of God. God told them, look, I give you everything in the garden for you. It's at your disposal. Enjoy your life. And then every day, God, the Bible said, would talk with them and fellowship with them. He said, no, there's one tree you don't touch. It belongs to me. Because God knew that in his relationship with man, his creation, there would be a part of their life that would certainly be consumed in the earth to live here. But there would be a part that he said, it belongs to me. And you've got to keep that separate. What belongs to me is sacred. So don't touch this. In the day you do, you will sin. And when you sin, you will die. Literally, the Hebrew says in dying, you will physically die. Spiritual death or separation from God will lodge in you. And then your body will become death doomed and mortal. Why would anybody, anybody walk away from that setup? The same reason they did is the same reason I did and the same reason you do. Look what the scripture said in Genesis chapter three. This is when Satan came to deceive them. Satan said to the woman about God's instruction. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Verse four, he said again to the woman, you will not surely die. God's a liar. God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The same trap that Satan used on the first couple is the same thing he uses on people today to get you to doubt the veracity and truthfulness of God's word. Go ahead and tell people you believe this to be the word of God. They'll laugh at you. You Neanderthal, what are you out of your mind? The Bible. And they think it's because they've been educated. And it has nothing to do with education. What it has to do with is a deception. Packaged in any way you want it that says, did God really say? Really? Did God really say? How about this? So they could be like God. They already were. They were already were made in the likeness and in the image of God. It's so unimaginably important that we grasp this simple truth that when you believe this lie, it will ruin your life, that there's something good for me, something good for you outside of God. That's what Satan convinced them of. That's why most people don't want to serve God. That's why most people don't want to walk with God as Christians. They think it's a life of subtraction. I can't tell you how many times people ask me this question. Hey, if I become a Christian, can I still fill in the blank? Because they think the enemy, even right now, has convinced them God will take some, something from me. God, walking with God is not a life of subtraction. It's not even a life of addition. It's a life of multiplication. And the deception is there's something good for me outside of God. Look how it came to pass. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. When the woman saw the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit and she ate it. She also gave it to her husband who was three counties away. He was right there with her. And then he ate it. 
And then the eyes of both of them were opened, and then they knew, then they knew that they were both naked. And then they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God among the trees of the garden. And God cried out and said, Adam, where are you? You see, when he cried out, Adam, where are you? The religious mind heard anger and said, Adam, where are you? I'm furious with you. But it wasn't that. It was the longing of a broken heart. Adam, where are you? But Adam could no longer hear the purity of his heavenly father and his God because his heart had been darkened. Sin had captured his soul. And the glory of God departed from him and he found out we're naked. And once they he bear, bore that nakedness, the first judgment in the Bible happened and it wasn't God judging man. It was man judging God. And Adam concluded and Eve concluded, he's coming to harm me. Because God said, the day you eat it, you'll die. I'm still living. He's coming to kill me. So he hid from God. He buried his life in shame. And that's what people have done ever since. They try to cover themselves. Just like Adam and Eve did. It's so important to understand. The last thing they did was try to cover their nakedness. And it was inadequate. And men and women have been trying to cover the nakedness of the absence of the dignity and worth that comes from God ever since. And it's as inadequate as those leaves were. They judged that God wanted to harm them. He came and spoke words of redemption immediately over them. But they didn't believe it. Because they had convinced that the God who loved them wanted to harm them. And for many of you like me, the, 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 the lie of religion has been God's come get you. You don't see his great love. Romans 3.23 tells us exactly how it happened. For all have sinned. Say it out loud. All. That's every one of us. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. When sin enters into a human's life, the glory leaves. The covering goes. Remember this, all sin. Everything we do, knowing God's plan and not doing it, it's rooted in believing the same deception. There's something good for me outside of God. God's restricting me. So this is really what will make me happy. And we, we lose the takeaway that my appraised value is the blood of his son. And the third question to, to answer is this, then how do we get our dignity and worth restored? How do we get our dignity and our worth restored? We get it by believing God's love and rejecting the lies of the enemy. I want you to listen to what Jesus said as he was about to bring this fully, into a fully, fully consummated to restore man's dignity and worth. Look at John 17, verse 22. Jesus said, he's praying now, he's talking to his heavenly father. He said, in the glory, the dignity and worth that you gave me, listen, I now give them. That they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me. That they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that you sent me. And now listen. And that the world may know this as well. That you have loved them as you have loved me. Listen. Jesus is revealing their value and their worth. The Father loves you exactly like he loves me. And I am now going to restore to them, Father, the dignity and worth. You see, Jesus was called in Scripture the last Adam. The first Adam sinned by trees, and the last Adam would bear sin, but not his own, my sin and your sin. And he said, Father, I'm coming to what the first Adam lost through sin. I will restore by paying their debt. And he said, and God's doing this because he desperately loves you. He loves you as he loves me. That's why when you read God so loved the world that he gave, it's the longing and desperation of God to again speak to you in the cool of the day. And you hear his voice and not hide in shame and not run to cover yourself or to run from God because of the shame of the things that you've uncovered in your life. This changes everything when you believe the love of God. It causes you to stop living in the deception that there's something good for me outside of God. Because when you give your life to Christ, who paid the debt that you couldn't pay, the last Adam who died for you, he restores back to you what Adam lost, your, the glory and the honor and the dignity and the worth. But this world and, it, and, and, and the culture born out of it from the pit of hell are designed to do one thing, 
to get you to doubt the love of God and that his word is not true over you, to get you to doubt the goodness of God and to come up with a God of your own and make your own God in your own image. That's what this world's driving us all to. It had me to a point to where I, without question, I was on my way to a life of addiction. But when I discovered that he loved me, that he valued me as much as his son, it changed everything. I went from a life of, of purposelessness and certainly it, I was in addiction. It was going to be a lifelong thing to a life of purpose, a life of freedom. And that's not unique to me. It's unique to anyone who will believe the love of the Father. That's why you must take next steps as a Christian. When I encourage you to come to church on weekends, it's not to punch some religious ticket. God, I did my church gig. Get off my back. It's so that you can be exposed to the truth that will make you free. You can understand the lies that are coming to steal, steal and kill and destroy your life. He wants you to experience what it means to be crowned. Not by a job or a promotion or a vacation or a whatever. Or even feeling like you're nothing because of whatever happened to you or through you. He said, I want you to know what it's like to be crowned with glory and honor and dignity and worth. That's why you should be in small groups, because in small groups, people will love you and accept you in your deepest shame. You will never heal as a human being fully until you get around other people made in the image of God and where you have hidden yourself from others and from God, you expose and they love you right through it. That's what small groups do. I don't care if it's a running group or if it's a Bible study. If that happens to you, it will change your life. That's why it's so important to know the love of God. Or we'll get together and be religious nonsense and, and be just religiously stupid and beat each other up. There's a devil for that. Take next steps. Feed on the word of God daily and discover how he sees you. You have to understand the simple fact God is desperate for you. When our daughter Alexa was three, about three years old, we lost her at our house. Anybody ever lose your kid? I mean, just a few minutes, okay, but she's lost. At that time, our, the ministry here, the church had just got on television, and that was in the internet was kind of being out there, and people would go look up my name, my address, and they would come and sit in front of our house in their car for hours. It was just kind of creepy. And so, you know, you kind of had to wonder who's out there and, well, she's missing. And we can't find her anywhere. And at first, you know, we're just rationally looking through the house. And now we can't find our daughter. She's three. And now we're no longer going, Alexa, now, Alexa, Alexa, Alexa. We're screaming at the top of our lungs, Alexa, running up and down through the house. Nothing. Now we, I, we're gone. We're outside. I don't care what the neighbors think. We are screaming at the top of our, Alexa, screaming, running back toward the edge of the woods. And all I could have my, in my mind, it started to run off. Someone took her. She'll never see her again. They'll kill her. And, and, and you can't, it's like you can't breathe, but you can't stop. If you've never had that happen to you, it's a feeling you'll never forget. And this was going on for like 15 minutes. We are paralyzed. I said, Michelle, I have to call the police. I mean, and your mind's going. And she said, well, okay, I'll keep looking. She went downstairs and we had a bin full of like baby dolls and Alexa crawled in there and fell asleep and looked just like one of the baby dolls. And Michelle screamed, John, I found her. And I run down where she's pulled her out of, the, out of that little box. She's just waking up. We're crying. We're hugging her. Because we were desperate. Had you gotten in my way when I was looking for Alexa? Could I discuss your desperation for 20 minutes? I'd have punched you in the mouth. <laughs> Say, get out of my way! Help me find Alexa! Well, can I have a discussion? Help me find her or get out of my way. It's, I mean, we were desperate. I want you to hear that desperation and then multiply it when Jesus said these words over you. In Luke 19, verse 10. Indeed, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save people who are lost. You are his Alexa, times a thousand. He didn't say like you're a fountain penny lost or a, an ink pen or a book. I want you to hear the desperation that we felt. 
the desperation that drove a savior to come from heaven to earth to die in your place. He said, I've come to seek and to save what's lost. They matter to me. And it's desperate. It's desperate. Through the years, people have asked me hundreds of times, why are you and Michelle so aggressive with church? Man, can't you just calm down and pastor or something? Because God's Alexa is lost. And he called every one of us to understand that passion of his heart and go get them for him. Last thing Jesus said, you go get me the lost of the world and you bring them to me because I died for them and I'm desperate for them. And most Christians live and die and they're indifferent to that desperation. Can you imagine had you been in my home that day and been indifferent to our screams of desperation? All I would have said to you is get out of my way. And sadly, as a pastor, many times I've had to say that to people, not unkindly. We just would like you to do this. I said, get out of my way. I could, I don't like that song. I can't tell you how little I care what song you like. Alexa's missing. Help me find her. God's Alexa is missing. Help me find her. Pastor, could we change the lighting? Are you out of your mind? Find my kid. That's what Jesus said when he left. You go, I'm desperate. When that desperation touches your soul, you'll do anything short of sin to reach people for God. Because I remember what it was like to feel lost. I remember what it was like to feel hopeless. I remember what it was like to feel like I had no course but addiction. But the love of God set me free. And he wants to set you free today. Oh, how he loves you, how he loves you, how he loves you, how he loves you. In both locations, let's stand together. Let's go into a time of just worship. And here's what I want you to understand. We're going to sing this chorus that says, I am who you say I am. It's a declaration of faith for us that you declare in worship. God, I am who you say I am. I can do what you say I can do. I will live the life that you called me to live because I'm crowned with glory and honor and dignity and worth. That's who I am. It's who I am because it's who you say I am. I will not be defined by anything else around me but you. And in this moment of worship, I want you to understand that in these times at the end of our service, the God's presence moving, we've uh, people get healed instantly in their body. God shows up and does amazing things because he's alive and he wants to move in people's lives. Now, he'll speak to your heart in a few moments like he did me. And it will take you places you never dreamed possible. I am who I, I am who you say I am. I am who you say I am. Would you sing that worship with us as they lead us? We worship you. Holy Spirit in this room 
that he does in the hearts of men and women, even people online, right now in Newcastle. He's doing things that only he can do. Moving miraculously in people's bodies, bringing wholeness in every realm of our lives, telling us the truth that makes us free. Lord, we worship you. We worship you. In a moment, I want to pray over everybody, but specifically a group of people. The Bible talks about gifts of the Holy Spirit. There are nine of them. One of those nine gifts of the Holy Spirit are called the Word of Knowledge. And here's what it is. It's a fragment of the knowledge of God about a person or a thing that God only knows. Now, the person may know, but the person that he reveals it to won't know. It doesn't mean they know everything. It's just a word or a fragment. And God does that, and you can, throughout Scripture, see, so that people can know out of all of humanity, he sees you. He's not the God of the billions. He's the God of the individual. That's why Jesus said, he's numbered the hairs on your head. You matter to God. As you're worshiping, the Holy Spirit again spoke so strongly to my heart that there are people here right now and perhaps online that there are things that have been in your heart to do with your life. Whether in business or, or, or the purpose of your life, it could even be relationships. And, and you keep hitting the ceiling where you just can't, you can't get past it. You just can't get on. It just seems like no matter what I do, and so you work harder, you work harder, and then you give up. I want you to understand something. You will never be able to cover yourself. You will never fulfill the purpose of heaven in relationships, the purpose of your life. Maybe perhaps like in my case, from a life moving toward addiction to a life of purpose. You'll never do that without God's hand, individually, uniquely, intentionally moving in your life. When you understand your value and worth and that he's desperate for you and that the plan he has for you, he doesn't ask you to go do it and come and show it to him like a little boy or a little girl that made something to please a parent. He said, we'll do it together. We'll labor and work together. It's a family business. And what I want you to understand that as you take those steps and you believe the truth of who God says you are and how much he loves you, Something called favor will show up in your life. Favor from God is God treating you better than you deserve. That's favor. And God said, I will give you favor with me. Now listen, and I will give you favor with people. Do you want to know what favor with people is? God will cause people to treat you better than you deserve. He will take you places with the breath of his favor that 10,000 years on this earth will never do for you. People ask me from where we started to where we are today, how did it happen? I can tell you one reason. God breathed on what he asked us to do. And we simply humbled ourselves and said, no matter how we feel, no how inadequate we feel, we know you love us. And we'll, 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 we'd love to work with you, Dad. We love it. It's a great family business. And I'll tell you, we've seen him show up in ways I can't even, I can't exaggerate. And, and God doesn't do that just for preachers. He doesn't do it for anybody in particular. It's for everybody. He has a plan for your life, and he wants you to move into that plan. He wants you to stop backing off of it and stop figuring out, well, I have to do this and I have to do that. And I, what you have to do is to let the Father show up and teach you and show you and breathe his favor on you. One breath of the favor of God. I'm telling you it changes everything. That's what it means to be loved by the Father. Not some you know, etherical kind of feeling, religious nonsense. Oh, we're loved and we'll go home and have coffee. Real love that makes a difference. Real love that shows up when everybody runs. Real love that says, I will lift you when you're broken. Real love that says, when you are broken, I love you. And I don't care what anyone else says. And lastly, I'll tell you this. He's the God of T-ball. What do I mean by that? Y'all ever been to watch kids play T-ball? Four or five years old, they stick the ball on a tee. And a little boy or girl, they hit, the, they swing to the hit. 10 strikes, keep hitting. Finally, they can't hit anything, the thing falls, they go run, they run to third base. <laughs> and you know what everybody does? Oh, oh, way to go, way to go, way to go, because three strikes, you're not out with God. Now in the world, people say, three strikes, go back to the dugout, you're out. God says, no, 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 I, I'm T-ball God. Keep swinging, big boy, keep swinging. Now, now yield to me, now watch what happens when I hold the bat with you. Ooh, watch that thing go. Ooh, yeah. Yeah, they'll never find that ball. 
That's what it means to have favor with God. And I don't care if you bunk that thing. He's cheering you on. And you start out maybe stumbling, but buddy, I'll tell you what God can do through a yielded life. Man, I want you to live that life. God wants you to live that life. I hunger for that for you. Let me pray over you. First, with every head bowed and eye closed, say, Pastor, that's me. I know there are things that I've actually even laid them aside or I just, I've said out loud, these words have come out of your mouth. I just can't figure it out. I don't know what to do anymore. That's the word of knowledge part. Those actual words have come out of your mouth. I just, it just, it's just no matter what I do, it's not enough. You're right. No matter what you do is not enough. But let him breathe on your life. Let his love saturate you and take you places. Never dream possible. If that's you, I want to pray for you. I'll do it right where you're standing. Just simply raise your hand quickly. So I know that I want to pray over you. If that's you. Thank you. You can put your hands back down. Let me pray over you. Father, I pray for every person here. Those who raise their hands and those who maybe have felt just too overwhelmed even to lift their hand. My prayer is that they will come to know the love of the Father today. That they have been crowned with glory and honor and dignity and worth. And their appraised value to you is the blood of Jesus. Your very life of the, of the Son of God. That you have a plan for their life. The God who rescued me will rescue them. The God who it took me from where I was and breathed on and, and moved by his grace will do the same for every one of them for the purpose of heaven in their life. So I speak his favor and his power over every person's life in this room. In Jesus' name, amen. With heads remaining bowed bowed and eyes closed, if you're here today and you were to draw your final breath on planet Earth and pass, do you know where you'd spend eternity? There is an eternity on the other side of this life. Jesus said there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. I don't, I, I, don't like, I don't like hell. Neither does God. That's why he said, I'm desperate to seek and save that which is lost. Because when I die, only one of two things can happen. I will pay for my own sins or I will receive the payment of a savior. Receiving Jesus into your life is not some religious leaf you turn over. It's receiving the living, breathing son of God who lives forevermore, rose from the dead and you receive him into your life. And he said, I turn no one away. I have borne your sin. I will take your sin debt and I will give you my righteousness. And he turns no one away. You either pay for your own sins after death or you receive the payment of the savior. There are, there are no other options. There's no way to cover yourself. You can't do it. Jesus said, I'm the only one who will restore back to them what Adam took. So if you're here today and you don't know that if you died today where you'd spend eternity, my prayer for you first is that you wouldn't put your faith in religion. You're a pastor, I'm not religious, believe me. It has nothing to do with religion. It's a relationship with God, not a bunch of rules you keep. God didn't send a rule book, he sent a man. God wrapped in flesh. I was baptized as a baby, wonderful, didn't make you a Christian. I was confirmed, fantastic, didn't make you a Christian. I go to church, great, doesn't make you a Christian. Have you acknowledged that you have sinned and need a savior and invited Christ into your heart? He only comes by invitation. So with every head bowed and eye closed, if you're here today and you've never done that, or you're not certain, I wanna make certain before you leave this place, you know that you've turned from your old life, you've given your life to him and received the gift, the free gift of eternal life and let the Father love you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here and you'd say, Pastor, would you please include me in that prayer? I want to receive Christ in my heart and make him the Lord and Savior of my life. With every head bowed and every eye closed, right where you're standing, I'll pray for you. Would you just lift your hand so I could see it and I'll pray for you. Thank you. God bless you, sir. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you, sir. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. You can put your hands back down. If you raised your hand or you should have, please pray this prayer. It's not some just dead religious prayer. You're inviting the living Christ to come into your sin-stained life. He turns no one away. He'll make you brand new. He'll take your sin debt. He'll give you his righteousness. And then you walk with him every day. You keep coming and learning of God and growing into the purpose of God for your life. Don't run from him. When you fail, run to him. Remember that. God doesn't find out you're messed up when you tell him. He loves you just like you are. 
You prayed out loud if you raised your hand or should have and you desire to receive Christ. And we're all going to pray it together with you. Pray it where you hear it. Say, Heavenly Father. Say it where you hear it. Say, Heavenly Father. I come to you in the name of Jesus. And I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the Son of God. He died on a cross to bear my sin debt. I open the door of my heart. I open the door of my life. And Jesus, I invite you in. I receive you now to be my Savior and Lord. Thank you for coming. I am now a child of God. My sin is wiped away. And I am heaven bound when I die. Amen. Amen. Give them a hand, would you? Best decision of your life.